Waiting for it, and we are live, back for day 18. I might be able to do this if I have two fours and you have two fives, your fingers. Oh, gosh. We have 18 <laughs> fingers. I can't do it on my own anymore, so it's if I want to have a guest. It is day 18 of 30. I'm doing 30 days of Facebook Live, talking to you guys about diabetes, health, tips, tricks, and how to get through the daily life that we do with our struggles and with our victories. Today I have a special guest. This is Karen Vandevecht, physical therapist and pelvic floor specialist. And yes, if you do know my last name, this is my mother. <laughs> she is wonderful, and she's an excellent PT. And she's going to talk to us today about some awesome things with the pelvic floor and bladder health and all that. But first, I'm going to dive in with the story of my diagnosis that you guys might not know. So when I was first diagnosed with diabetes, it wasn't because I knew I had diabetes or that I should go get checked for it. It was rather that I had a few months where I was peeing all the time. I know you guys can handle this, talking about pee, because you probably had a similar story. I was thirsty. I could never quench my thirst, drinking all day. I was going to the bathroom at least once an hour, which is absurd. And from her advice, actually, I went to the hospital thinking that I had a urinary tract infection. So I went in, said, I think I have UTI, and, uh, you know, check me out. And they came back, so we've got to run some more blood tests. we got to figure out what's going on, because we think you might have diabetes. And from that moment on, my life has never been the same. Uh, and obviously, she was there for that. She remembers the whole story. But uh, that leads me into the talk for today about I thought that I had a urinary tract infection, but bladder health, how important that is, and why we should pay more attention to it. So I'll give the floor to you to talk about bladder and <laughs> urine and <laughs> all that good stuff. As you can probably see, we talk about a lot of things at our household freely, right? <laughs> it's healthcare, and so um, thank you, Matt. And uh, yes, that was a day that changed all our lives, but particularly your life. And uh, yet, I'm so grateful that you choose to take a challenging part of your life and share it with the world to help them. So that's what I like to do too. I, um, as Matt said, I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist. I deal with anything that goes wrong in the abdominal pelvic region. So today, I just have a little bit of time that I want to talk to you about what a happy bladder is. So I keep that term because I think it keeps it a little bit lighter or whatnot. And I want to say I'm so glad I know what I know because I have many people asking me all the time about their symptoms. So I just want to talk to you today about what is a happy bladder. What is an unhappy bladder first, okay? So an unhappy bladder might be an overactive bladder. It might be a... An, a leaky bladder, which would mean that somebody has incontinence. And it also might be somebody that has a painful bladder. So as a disclaimer, Matt and I would also recommend that if you have any symptoms you're concerned about, you would speak to your healthcare provider, your doctor, um, because if you do have any of those going on, especially pain with urination, um, there could be a urinary tract infection. Matt had the urgency, frequency, that type of thing, insatiable thirst which we all know now is indicative of um, diabetes or can be. Um, so unhappy bladder, let's go through, the only thing I wanna to address today is the overactive bladder. So overactive bladder is somebody that has urgency and frequency. So that urgency means I need to go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. If you give in to that urgency, you may develop what's called frequency. That means going to the bathroom too often. So this is my question, what is too often? Matt said, earlier that he was going to the bathroom about once every hour, right? So that is too often. I have patients that sometimes go to the bathroom 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Had a gentleman that got up every 45 minutes at night and he still had a smile on his face. And I thought, that is crazy. He ended up having something else called interstitial cystitis, which is another topic. So what is normal? for the bladder function. So how often do you think you should be going to the bathroom? Okay, I want you to think about that. How often do you actually go? Do you pay any attention to that? So if you're drinking fluids in moderation and you're listening to your bladder, you should go every two to four hours, okay? You shouldn't be dehydrating yourself. You shouldn't be drinking tons and tons and tons of fluids so that you have to go every half an hour. So every two to four hours during the daytime, at nighttime, do you think you should get up at nighttime? What's normal for nighttime? That's a tricky one. Uh, <laughs> a few months ago, actually, I let her know that I was having some trouble with that, and we came to the conclusion it was likely because I had a lot of spicy food, and I was very, very stressed, but I was getting up 
between six and eight times a night with a full bladder. And I know that's not right. Mm -hmm. So Didn't I'm gonna, make sense, I'm right? I'm going to guess it's maybe once or twice a night's normal. Okay, you're about right. So before the age of 65, getting up either zero times a night or once a night is considered normal, okay? If you get up twice or more a night, you may be drinking way too much before bedtime or... Like Matt said, you could be stressed. You could be waking up and thinking, oh, I got all this stuff on my mind. I might as well go to the bathroom. Or you may have a physical response where you're just processing a lot of the fluid and then you just need to evacuate, really, empty your bladder. Um, so when you're 65 or over, getting up once a night is expected. If you're 80 or over, getting up twice a night is expected just because of the way we process our fluids. So I don't want to get up at night. I do not drink beverages approximately two hours before bedtime. I drink my beverages the, the what, you know, the other 12 to 16 hours of the day. And then um, I quit an hour or two before bedtime because I don't want to get up. Um, so what about, um, what is normal um, quantity? Okay, and that sounds like a really weird question, but I have homework for you. When you urinate, you should be sitting and you shouldn't have any straining or pain when you urinate. When you empty your bladder, you should think, okay, I'm gonna do my counting like Karen said. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. You're gonna count the stream, when your stream starts and when your stream ends, not the dribble. You can't count that at the end, that doesn't count. If your stream is three or four or five seconds, hmm, not good enough. If your stream is around eight seconds, that's just about right. Or 10, 12, that's fine. If your stream is 45 seconds, we don't want this ginormous bladder, right? We can actually overstretch our bladder if we don't empty when we should. That's not a good thing, and that can lead to urinary retention, another completely bummer scenario. So if you're emptying and you're going, oh, that was eight seconds, or that was 10 or 12 or 14, that's reasonable, okay? So just make sure you have a decent stream, you're not straining, and there's no pain. The other thing is when you urinate, don't um, take your time. Sit if you're a female, stand if you're a guy and you prefer to stand, but don't just try to push it out and run. We see pediatric patients or child patients, children patients that's just like, I'd rather play, so let me pee really quick and dash off, right? So sit, relax, and, and I almost said and, and enjoy. <laughs> so anyway, and then do we empty our bladder 100%? What do you think? I'm pretty sure it's about 85%. Oh, wow, pretty scientific guesstimate. So sometimes we do. Sometimes we might empty 100%. Sometimes we might leave one, two, three ounces in our bladder and that's considered normal. Hmm. Okay, just kind of depends on, on the scenario and the, the anatomy, that type of thing. Um, so that's what's normal. And then how, I want you to know what a normal bladder would act like. So when the bladder is empty, think of it as a flattened football or a flattened balloon. And as your kidneys process your fluids, it fills slowly, okay? It's just filling, filling, filling. About halfway full, your bladder nerves send a signal to your brain and says, hey, you know what? When you get home, you might want to use the bathroom. Or after this meeting's done, you might want to empty your bladder. Well, what would an overactive bladder do? Somebody that has, you know, a very excited bladder, it'd be like, go now. And you're like, ah, wait a second, that's overactive. We don't want that. And some people might leak with that. Some people might just have discomfort, like, oh, I got to go now. And then they go to the bathroom. You're like, wait a second, that was not matching the amount of urge. The amount that came out did not match my urge. So you think, hmm, something's not quite right. So as it fills, a normal bladder would fill to a reasonable quantity. And then when you sit on the toilet, it relaxes. I'm sorry, the bladder contracts your pelvic floor, the muscles underneath you, should relax. So some people have really tight pelvic floor muscles, just like you can have tight muscles anywhere else on your body, you can have tight muscles in your pelvic region. And that can contribute to urgency frequency. So instead of doing mass quantities of kegels, like some people think, I'll just do my kegels, my pelvic floor exercise, I'll be fine. Mm, not always the case. So that little plug for seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist so they can determine if your pelvic floor is working optimally or not. The last thing I want you to talk, think about is for why you'd have urgency frequency is that, Matt uh, led into this, is that you might be drinking things that um, could provoke urgency frequency. So what was the one thing that triggered your bladder? It most likely was stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely stress. Before diagnosis or the recent one? Oh, this is one? the recent one. Oh, the recent one, yeah. Likely stress. 
or I was recommended to stop drinking three to four hours before bed, just as a safety precaution. But spicy foods was the third one. Spicy foods. You liked it on eggs oh, and everything. every meal. Right? <laughs> and the other thing is, don't be drinking too much caffeine. So there are certain things that are, are bladder irritants. So think about this in your own life. Is there anything that makes you need to use the restroom more frequently? Of course, if you're drinking gallons of water, and by the way, you don't need gallons of water throughout the day. You need to sip your water throughout the day. That's the best beverage, right? But, uh, and this helps you understand how much you should be drinking. Your urine shouldn't be dark and stinky, and it shouldn't be colorless, like no color whatsoever. I mean, that's not gonna typically be a problem, but you don't need to drink that much fluid to you know, constantly be pouring water down your throat, okay? So, bladder irritants. Caffeine is a biggie, right? Carbonation, so sodas, artificial sweeteners, citrus juices, and alcohol. So those are the top five. There's other things like, you know, tomato products, some chocolate, you know, um, high sugar content, that type of thing. But those five are the worst. Sodas, because it's got, you know, let me ask you this, diet soda. Diet Cola, what does that have in it? Aspartame. Has, a, has an artificial sweetener, has, could have caffeine, caffeine and it's got Liquid. carbonation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a triple whammy. So I had a silly co-worker like, Karen, what if I drink a rum and Diet Coke? Well, okay, that's a quadruple whammy, okay? So those are bladder irritants. So if you're have, experiencing um, urgency frequency, an overactive bladder, I would encourage you to look at your what you're eating and drinking. See if eliminating that would um, make a difference. I'd encourage you to count how long it takes you to urinate. If it's, you know, the right amount and you're emptying about every two to four hours, that's that's awesome. If you're going every hour, I'd try to encourage you to stretch a little longer if you have small volumes. So maybe if you're at home, you think, I really shouldn't have had to go can i wait a little bit longer next time so when you're at home to think just think relax don't be drinking the diet sodas just sipping on your water herbal tea that type of thing um and try to stretch the time frame just a bit just a bit calm your body you might need to see somebody um, for pelvic floor training whether it's relaxation or whether it's exercise diaphragm breathing is a good calming effect like what matt said stress can affect our bladder as well and um, so we want to do diet modification, behavior modification, just to address those aspects and see if that makes a difference in your bladder function. And I'm sure I'd be happy to answer questions through Matt if I didn't uh, directly answer your questions with this little chat. But is any, anything else you want to make sure I cover? For... I think it's my turn to ask you a question. <laughs> okay. What is the difference between now and before I was diagnosed that may have caused me to pee more often than normal? My understanding, since I'm not a physician, and definitely not an endocrinologist, <laughs> is that the higher sugars, our body is trying to always stay in homeostasis or balance. So we're trying to process and get that sugars out of us as fast as possible. And so our, the one way we get rid of that is urinating them out. So is that, that is correct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, before you diagnosed, the large reason why you are peeing so much and that you're always thirsty is that your blood essentially without the insulin to carry the glucose away into your muscles and liver and adipose tissue is that you basically have syrup running through your blood vessels. It's very thick and it's very hard on your body. And so as a result, your body craves water to dilute that a lot more. And as it dilutes it, as you get more water into your system, you can't ever bring it down to a normal blood sugar range. So you're never gonna be um, completely happy with how much you drink. Uh, you will pee a lot more and as she said, it's true. Your body is trying to flush out those sugars and you are peeing a lot of sugar out, which is why diabulimia unfortunately is a thing. I can talk more about that later on in a different live, um, but it is your body trying to flush out that extra glucose in your system because there is likely a lot of it since you do not have insulin on board to treat your diabetes. So the reason I was peeing and that many of you may have been peeing a lot more before you're diagnosed as well is likely because or at least in part due to the fact that you had high blood sugar and your body was trying to flush it out. So that is it for today as far as pelvic floor specialist Karen Vandevecht helping us out today. And uh, if you guys do have any questions, please let me know in the comments. If you have ideas for future lives and stuff you would like to know more about, again, let us know. We'd love to help you. And we've got uh, about 12 days left, I think, of the Facebook Live Challenge. So 
Excited to talk to you guys more about that. And uh, have a great rest of your weekend. It's a beautiful Sunday here in San Diego. Hope you guys are enjoying your day. And uh, have a great night. Keep up the fight.